Welcome to a new episode from English Plus Podcast. Today, our episode is Word Power. We will learn about something interesting related to a specific type of traditional art in India, and then we will discuss the meaning of 10 key words in context. Don't forget that you can practice what you learn on the website and make sure you make these 10 words you're going to learn in today's episode a part of your permanent active vocabulary bank. And there's a lot to learn on our website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com. So after you finish listening to this episode, take some time and go explore our website. And I'm certain that you will find something interesting you will want to learn more about. And now let's get back to our topic for today, Art at the Threshold. We will talk about Rangoli today, and we will learn 10 new words in the context of our story. The words we are going to learn today are palpable, sacrosanct, modest, adorn, prescriptive, arabesque, filigree, coruscate, fugacious, and specter. So, are you ready to learn about something interesting and build your vocabulary with English Plus? Let's get started. I would like to welcome my good buddy Ben, who's going to co-host this episode with me. Thank you for joining me, Ben. Thank you, Danny. It's always a pleasure learning new words in the context of an interesting story. Glad to be a part of it. All right, then. Today, I would like to talk about a special kind of art that comes from the great country of India. Yes, India has a rich and diverse cultural heritage, and its art reflects that. One of the most famous forms of Indian art is Madhubani painting, also known as Mithila painting. It originated in the Mithila region of Bihar and is characterized by bold lines, vibrant colors, and intricate designs that depict nature, Hindu gods and goddesses, and everyday life. Another famous form of Indian art is Warli painting, originating from the Warli tribe in Maharashtra. It is known for its simple yet powerful imagery depicting rural life, nature, and rituals. These are just a few examples of the rich and diverse art forms found in India. That's right. Uh, today, we will talk specifically about Rangoli. Sure, Rangoli is a traditional Indian art form that involves creating patterns and designs on the floor using colored powders, usually made from rice flour or flower petals. It is usually made during festivals such as Diwali and is believed to bring good luck and prosperity to the home. Rangoli designs can range from simple geometric shapes to more complex, intricate designs featuring gods, animals, and nature scenes. Rangoli is a popular form of folk art in India and is an important part of Indian culture, symbolizing hospitality and welcoming guests into the home. Can we still find Rangoli in India today? Yes, Rangoli is still a very popular form of art in India and can be found in homes, temples, and public spaces, particularly during festivals and special occasions. It is a vibrant and colorful expression of traditional Indian culture and continues to be practiced by many people across India. Additionally, Rangoli competitions are often held where participants create large and intricate designs showcasing their skills and creativity. Rangoli is not just an art form, but also an important part of Indian heritage and is treasured by many people who view it as a symbol of the country's rich cultural heritage. All right then. Let's start with our story about Rangoli, or art at the threshold, and then we will discuss the meaning of the 10 key words we have within our story. Shall we? Would you like to read the story for us, Ben? Of course. So, our story is about a traditional art form from India. Art at the threshold. Regardless of the culture, home is where the spirit of a people is palpable. In India, the home is almost sacrosanct, a reflection of one's innermost person. On earthen surfaces in their native country and on the concrete doorsteps of homes in their adopted nations, Indian women carry out the ancient tradition of Rangoli, decorating the threshold with turmeric, indigo, lentils, and other natural substances. These designs provide a vibrant welcome mat to even the most modest dwelling. The exact origins of Rangoli are unknown. But art historians assume that the tradition began as a form of thanksgiving. To the people of India, the floor is synonymous with the earth, a mother figure that supports all life. To adorn the floor of a house is to honor the house and the earth as special places. The art form has an added dimension, 
teaching children that beauty in the home is something that can be created easily and does not require material possessions. While Rangoli designs vary from region to region and family to family, they follow prescriptive patterns, often a series of dots or dashes aligned in the shapes of plants, animals, gods and goddesses, or geometric forms. Although thin sticks wound with cloth are sometimes used, the basic tool for Rangoli is the hand. The artist begins by placing her materials in small containers with wide brims. After selecting freshly swept spot on the floor or doorstep, she creates her design spontaneously. She pinches a bit of powder between her forefinger and thumb, then shakes off the excess. She moves her hand to the chosen spot, slides her thumb slowly over the forefinger, which acts like a miniature shovel, and then drops off the powder carefully to make a swirling arabesque. The materials may also be sieved through a clenched fist, using fingertips to trace filigree patterns. Lentils, grains, pebbles, and flowers are added for texture and color. The designs glow in sunlight and coruscate in reflected moonlight. Whether an everyday routine or a celebratory ritual, Rangoli turns a common floor into momentary poetry. Its fugacious nature, whereby the designs are swept away with a grass broom at day's end, if they haven't been trampled beforehand, emphasizes the process of creation. Once the beautiful pictures are swept away, only their specters linger in the minds of their creators. So, in the text, the author is discussing the tradition of Rangoli in India and its significance in both Indian culture and the homes of Indian people. The text highlights the fact that Rangoli is an art form that is created spontaneously using hand gestures and natural materials and is viewed as a way of honoring the house and the earth. The text also mentions the fleeting nature of Rangoli as the designs are usually swept away by the end of the day, emphasizing the process of creation over the final product. A very interesting story indeed. I'm so fascinated by all kinds of traditional art forms, but this one has a special magical aspect to it. However, let's focus now on the keywords. Let's start with our very first keyword for today. Ben, what can you tell me about the word palpable? P-A-L-P-A-B-L-E. How do we use it in context and what does it mean? The word palpable is used in the text to describe the spirit of a people that is palpable in the home. The word palpable means able to be touched or felt physically or easily perceived or detected. In this context, the author is using the word palpable to describe a sense of the spirit of a people that is so strong that it can be felt or perceived in the home, as if it were something that could be touched. The author is suggesting that the spirit of the people of India is particularly strong and can be felt in the homes of India where the tradition of Rangoli is carried out. Very well. Now let's move on to the second key word in our story. What can you tell me about the word sacrosanct? S-A-C-R-O-S-A-N-C-T. How do we use it in context and what does it mean? The word sacrosanct is used in the text to describe the home in India, which is described as almost sacrosanct. The word sacrosanct means regarded as too important or valuable to be interfered with. In this context, the author is using the word sacrosanct to suggest that the home is considered to be a highly valuable and important place in Indian culture. The use of the word almost before sacrosanct implies that the author recognizes that while the home is highly valued, it is not considered to be completely inviolable. All right then, what about the next key word? What can you tell me about the word modest? M-O-D-E-S-T. How do we use that word in context and what does it mean? The word modest is used in the text to describe even the most modest dwelling. The word modest means having or showing a moderate or humble estimate of one's merits, importance, etc. In this context, the author is using the word modest to describe a dwelling that is considered to be simple or unassuming in its appearance or size. The author is suggesting that even the most modest of homes can be decorated with Rangoli designs and transformed into vibrant, welcoming spaces. Can we use the word modest in other contexts, conveying other meanings? 
Yes, the word modest has multiple meanings and can be used in various contexts to convey different senses. In addition to its meaning as having or showing a moderate or humble estimate of one's merits, importance, etc., the word modest can also mean small in size or amount, like a modest income or a modest house. It can also mean simple or plain in style or appearance, like a modest dress or a modest proposal. It can mean having moderate qualities or abilities, like a modest talent or a modest athlete. So you can see that the meaning of the word modest can vary depending on the context in which it is used. Can you give me some examples of how we can use the word modest in other meanings? Sure. Here are some examples of how the word modest can be used in different senses. When it means simple or plain in style or appearance, we can say, for example, she wore a modest dress to the wedding. When we mean small in size or amount, we can say she lived on a modest salary and saved most of her income. When it means having moderate qualities or abilities, we can say he was a modest musician, but he loved to play the guitar in his free time. When modest means showing moderation or restraint, we can say he had a modest drinking habit and never got too drunk. It can also mean not making excessive claims or demands. And for example, we can say the company has modest expectations for the new product launch. Great. Now let's move on and talk about another keyword. What can you tell me about the word adorn? A-D-O-R-N. How did we use it in context and what does it mean? The word adorn was used in the text to describe the act of decorating the threshold with rangoli. The verb adorn means to enhance or beautify something, often by adding decorative elements to it. In the context of the text, to adorn the floor of a house means to decorate the floor with rangoli designs, which are made using turmeric, indigo, lentils, and other natural substances. The idea is to create a beautiful and welcoming entrance to the home. The verb adorn suggests the act of making something more attractive or adding elegance to it. Can we use adorn in a metaphorical sense? Yes, adorn can also be used in a metaphorical sense to describe the enhancement of qualities or attributes of a person, a thing, or an idea. For example, we can say her personality was adorned with kindness and generosity, or we can say the city was adorned with lights and decorations for the festival, or the book was adorned with vivid descriptions and vivid imagery. In these examples, the word adorn is used to suggest that something is made more attractive or appealing by the addition of certain qualities or features. Very well. Now let's move on and talk about the next key word. What can you tell me about the word prescriptive? P-R-E-S-C-R-I-P-T-I-V-E. How do we use that word in context and what does it mean? The word prescriptive was used in the context of Rangoli designs in the text. The word prescriptive means relating to or prescribing rules or regulations, especially in relation to correct behavior or usage. In the context of the text, prescriptive patterns refers to the traditional and conventional designs that are followed in making Rangoli. The use of prescriptive suggests that there is a set of established rules and guidelines that are followed when creating Rangoli and that deviations from these rules are not accepted. In other words, Rangoli designs are expected to conform to certain conventions rather than being purely creative and spontaneous. This word is very close to prescription, the thing we get when we visit a doctor. How are the two words related? Yes, you are correct. The words prescriptive and prescription are related. Both words come from the Latin word prescribere, which means to write out or prescribe. In the context of medicine, a prescription is a written order from a doctor for a specific medicine or treatment. Similarly, prescriptive can be thought of as prescribing or laying down specific rules or guidelines for a particular behavior or activity. In the context of the text, prescriptive patterns are seen as guidelines or rules that must be followed when creating Rangoli designs. In this sense, the word prescriptive conveys a sense of obligation or requirement, just as a prescription is something that must be followed in order to receive the benefits of a particular medicine or treatment. Can we use the word prescriptive to convey a negative meaning? Yes, prescriptive can convey a negative meaning when used in certain contexts. For example, if something is described as too prescriptive, it might mean that the rules or guidelines are overly strict 
or constraining, and do not allow for much creativity or individual expression. In this sense, prescriptive might have a negative connotation, suggesting that the rules are restrictive or inflexible. Very well. That was about prescriptive. Now let's move on and talk about yet another key word in our context. What can you tell me about the word arabesque? A-R-A-B-E-S-Q-U-E. How do we use it in context and what does it mean? In the context of the text, arabesque is used to describe the intricate and flowing patterns created in the Rangoli designs. An arabesque is a type of decorative design that features complex interlacing patterns of curves and swirls. The word arabesque comes from the Arabic word arabisk, which means nomadic. This refers to the idea that the decorative style originated in the Arab world and was later adopted and developed by other cultures. In art and architecture, the term arabesque is typically used to describe elaborate decorative designs that feature interlacing patterns of curves and swirling shapes, often with a focus on geometric forms. These designs are often found in a variety of decorative arts such as ceramics, textiles, and architecture. All right, so do we use the word arabesque only to refer to artwork, or can we use it in other contexts as well? The word arabesque can also be used in other contexts beyond art. In general use, an arabesque refers to a decorative design that features flowing interlacing lines and curves, often in a stylized decorative pattern. The term can also be used to describe a particular type of dance step or posture, as well as other decorative elements or forms in various creative fields such as music, architecture, and fashion. The word has a broader meaning than just in the context of art. Very well, that was about arabesque. Now let's move on and talk about another keyword. What can you tell me about the word filigree? F-I-L-I-G-R-E-E. -E. How do we use that in context and what does it mean? Filigree was used in the context of Rangoli as a description of a technique used to create intricate patterns. Filigree is an ornamental work of fine wire, typically of gold or silver, used to decorate metalwork, jewelry, or other objects. In the context of Rangoli, the term filigreed was used to describe how the Rangoli materials are sieved through a clenched fist and then traced with the fingertips to create delicate and intricate patterns. Does it have to use silver or gold threads, or can we use other types of thread or wire to do it? No, it is not limited only to gold or silver threads, although these are the most commonly used threads. But other metals or materials like brass, copper, or plastic can also be used to make filigree. All right then, now let's talk about another key word from our story. What can you tell me about the word coruscate? C-O-R-U-S-C-A-T-E. How do we use it in context and what does it mean? Coruscate is used in the text to describe how the Rangoli designs glow in reflected moonlight. The word means to emit bright flashes of light or to sparkle or shimmer. It can be used to describe anything that shines or glistens brightly and is often used to describe a highly polished surface, a dazzling gem, or a shimmering light. In the context of our story, it conveys the idea that the Rangoli designs shining brightly in the light of the moon. Can we use coruscate to talk about something that sparkles metaphorically, like someone's eyes? Yes, of course. Coruscate can also be used to describe something that sparkles metaphorically, such as someone's eyes or a brilliant wit, as well as to describe a sparkling appearance. All right then, now let's move on and talk about another key word from our story. What can you tell me about the word fugacious? F-U-G-A-C-I-O-U-S. Fugacious. How do we use it in context and what does it mean? Fugacious is an adjective that means fleeting or short-lived. In our context, the word was used to describe something that is here today and gone tomorrow, or to describe something that exists or lasts only for a very short time. For example, we might say that the beauty of youth is fugacious, meaning that it is temporary and that it will soon disappear. The word fugacious comes from the Latin word fugax, which means fleeing or flying away. Can we use fugacious in other contexts? Yes, the word fugacious can be used in other contexts to describe something that is fleeting, transitory, or short-lived. For example, one might describe a person's youth as fugacious or the fleeting nature of fame. Perfect. Now let's talk about one last keyword from our story. What can you tell me about the word specter? 
S P E C T E R, Spectre. How do we use it in context and what does it mean? Spectre refers to a ghost or a haunting apparition, typically associated with feeling of fear or unease. In the context of the story, it may have been used to describe a haunting presence or the lingering memory of a past event. The word can also be used more broadly to describe any kind of phantom, phantom like, or elusive image. So it was not used with a negative connotation in our story, was it? No, Spectre was not used with a negative connotation in our story. It was used to refer to a ghostly apparition or something seen in the mind's eye with a connotation of wonder and mystery. Wonderful. Now, before we wrap up the episode, can you sum up in brief the 10 key words we talked about? Sure thing. Here's a brief summary of the 10 key words we discussed. We talked about palpable, which means able to be touched or felt, which is often used to describe a strong emotional or physical sensation. We talked about sacrosanct, which means considered to be sacred and inviolable, often used to describe something that is highly valued or respected. We also talked about modest, which can mean simple, unassuming, or humble, but can also describe something that is not excessive or having limited extent, or refer to someone who has a low opinion of their own abilities. We also talked about adorn, which means to decorate or enhance the appearance of something, and this is often used in the context of adding ornamental details to an object or person. After that, we talked about prescriptive, which means prescribing or regulating, which is often used in the context of rules, regulations, or norms, especially in the field of grammar, ethics, or medicine. We talked about arabesque, which refers to a type of decorative design characterized by intricate, flowing, interlacing patterns, which is often used in context of art and architecture, but can also describe an elaborate, ornate style. We talked about filigree, which refers to delicate, lacy metalwork often used to decorate jewelry or metal objects, typically made by intertwining fine wire or threads. We then talked about coruscate, which means to sparkle or shine brilliantly, and it is often used to describe the light produced by diamonds or other precious stones. And then we talked about fugacious, which means fleeting or temporary, and it is often used to describe things that don't last long or are ephemeral. And finally, we talked about specter, which means a ghostly apparition, and it is often used in the context of a supernatural appearance or a haunting, but can also describe a vague and difficult to define sense of fear or unease. All right then, now let's wrap up our discussion for today with a couple of other questions about the story. How important do you think it is to preserve these kinds of traditional art like Rangoli? The importance of preserving traditional art forms such as Rangoli depends on various factors like cultural heritage, artistic value, and historical significance. Such art forms reflect the history, beliefs, and values of a particular community and help to preserve the unique cultural identity. Additionally, traditional art forms are often closely linked to religious and spiritual practices, providing an opportunity for people to connect with their cultural roots and express their creativity. And so, preserving these art forms is important from both cultural and artistic perspectives. What do we say to people who ridicule these kinds of art forms or traditions? To those people who ridicule these kinds of art forms or traditions, one can argue that they are a significant part of a culture's heritage and history, and preserving them is important for maintaining cultural identity. Additionally, traditional art forms like Rangoli often require a great deal of skill and craftsmanship, and the efforts put into creating them deserve to be respected and appreciated. Furthermore, such art forms and traditions often hold deep meaning and significance to those who practice them, and disregarding or mocking them can be hurtful and insensitive. Well, I guess that's what we want to talk about for today. Thank you very much for co-hosting this episode with me, Ben. You're welcome. I'm glad I could help. And to our listeners everywhere, I would like to thank you very much for listening to another Word Power episode from English Plus Podcast. Don't forget to check our website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com, and explore the wealth of learning opportunities you can find there. This is your host, Danny. I will see you next time.